Give the, would you go ahead and be seated, put your Bible or something on your lap, and give the Lord a great big hand. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I, I know that so far, next Sunday night when we gather for uh, our baptismal time and celebration, we're going to also be having some time of worship. So we get to have a little extended time of personal worship, sharing a heart with the Lord, a little calmer atmosphere on a Sunday evening versus a Sunday morning. But we already have seven people getting baptized. You know, and that's awesome. That is awesome. And maybe if you've never been baptized, your time's next Sunday night. We are in part two of a, of a series based off of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 called Never Give In, Never Give Up. If you give in, you will end up giving up. And you need to know that Jesus does not want you to give in, give into life. We're not going to give in or give up into life. Today, we're going to kind of plant ourselves on a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to talk to you today about faith the most important thing that you could ever have in order to live your spiritual life and be victorious. So as we move in, let's just, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, and this is what Paul says in chapter 9, then we're moving into chapter 10. Do you not know that those who run in a race run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Basically, this verse is saying you should go into life with the attitude is you're going to win. You should go into any struggle, any challenge, any temptation, any trial, anything spiritual, anything natural with the attitude that you are going to win. Paul says you need to run the race that you may obtain in such a way that you are going to, main, that you are going to obtain it, that you are going to win. In other words, whatever it takes to do, you need to run that race. What is it going to take? What is it going to require in order for you to win in life? Is it going to require for you to have a little bit more prayer time? Is it going to require for you to get water baptized? Is it going to require for you to read the Bible now and then? Is it going to require for you to worship the Lord, even at your home? Is it going to require for you to be thinking about Jesus during the day and challenging your own self to live for him? What's it, what needs to change in order for you to succeed in whatever it is you're facing? You are facing life, and life wants to punch you in the face. Life wants to give you struggles and challenges, and you need to know that God has called you to run this race and that you need to run in such a way that you are going to obtain. You are going to win the prize. You are going to continue. In for, jumping down now to chapter 10, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we get our text that we started with last week. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. So he's now going to an Old Testament story. Paul is talking to the Greeks and he's talking to the Jewish people of the city of Corinth. That's where this letter is written to the city of Corinth. And he is communicating to them a story that he assumes that they know. So this is an Old Testament story. And the story is about Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. So we've got generation after generation after generation has been told again and again and again, you're worthless, you're nothing but a slave, you have no value, you are nothing but a servant. And we have multiple generations that that's ingrained in their DNA, ingrained in their mentality, ingrained in their thought process, and they don't think they can win. So Paul's using this example of a group of people being led by Moses coming out of, the prom, coming out of the, uh, Egypt, going into the promised land, and he says he wants you to re re realize this. All of them, all of them, all their fathers were, were under, we all had the same cloud, and last Sunday I shared with you what that cloud was in great detail. So you can go online and you can listen to last Sunday's message. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. They all got to eat manna. They all had, they all had the same food. They all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They all had the exact same opportunity. They all drank from the same spiritual drink. They all drank from Jesus Christ. They all ate the, the manna from heaven. They all heard the same preaching from Moses. They all were in the same environment. And then it says this, but with most of them, isn't this amazing? 
most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And it says here, for most of them, God was not well pleased. The majority of them. The majority of them that came out of Egypt into the wilderness, going into the promised land, the majority, God was not well pleased. The question that we have to ask ourselves is why? Why weren't you pleased with them? They left their homes. They left their place. They're following you out in the desert. They're following the cloud by day, the fire by night. They're out in the wilderness. They're walking through the different rituals that Moses is now teaching them. Moses has gone and got the Ten Commandments. They're applying this to their life, and God says, I'm not well pleased. So we have to find out what pleases God. Because I don't want to be in the same boat. I don't want to be in the same place. Do you want to be living your life and doing all kinds of things for God, but God isn't even happy with what you're doing? Why? Why would God say this to them? Which requires us now to go to Hebrews 11.6, which we are going to do a deep dive in this verse and pick it apart. But without faith, but without faith, so we have something here, a key, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we're going to take this uh, verse apart practically word by word. The first one we're going to start with is faith. And the, the Greek word for faith means to believe to the extent of complete trust and reliance. To believe in, to have confidence in. In other words, if you do not trust in God, it's impossible to please him. If you do not have confidence in him, you can't please him. It says, but without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please him. The word impossible is pretty amazing because it's pertaining to being impossible because of a lack of power to alter or control circumstances. What makes it impossible is you don't have the power to change it. When something is referred to as impossible, it means it can't change and you have no source, no power in order to be able to change it. And that's saying here that without faith, you do not possess the source that pleases God. You do not possess the power that pleases God. You do not possess what is required in order to please God, which means a lot of people in the wilderness they did the rituals, they did the behavior, they did the actions, but in their heart, they didn't have confidence in God. They didn't trust him. They didn't have faith in him. So let's continue. In, in, I want to talk to you about the word impossible. Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible, same Greek word, impossible, not possible, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So this verse is telling us that that word impossible is, is being applied to bulls and goats, and that their blood could not take away sin. It, it doesn't have the power to take away sin, it doesn't have the ability to take away sin, but the blood of Jesus did. The blood of Jesus actually had the power to remove sin. Another example of impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Why? Because God has all the control, all the power, and can change any situation. And the word impossible means that you do not have the ability to control the situation. You don't have the power to make a change. But with God, nothing will be impossible. That's a pretty important Bible verse. That is pretty important to realize whatever I'm facing, God has the power to change it. God has the power. You know what? One problem that a lot of us have, though, one of the issues that we have is we want God to change it our way. And we tell God, this is how you need to fix this situation. Instead of, what's your will, and I'll obey it, what we say is, this is what I think you should do. And if you're really a God of love, you would do this. We're trying to manipulate them all the time. We're trying to always get God to, to um, see that if he made our life more comfortable, we'd all be better. And God is <laughs> saying, guess what? I'm not a genie in a bottle, but I have rescued you from hell. And now I'm going to ask you to continue to trust me to get you all the way to eternal life. And I'm going to ask you to follow me. 
And then another word impossible, Hebrews 6, 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. There is no power anywhere that could force God to lie. God, doesn't, God does not lie, nor does he have the ability to lie. And this is verses using that same word impossible. So now let's go back to Hebrews eleven six 6 and continue to tear it apart. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we're gonna look at the word please. The word please means to cause someone to be well disposed toward or to be pleased with someone or acceptance. And that in order for you to be accepted by God, you must have faith. You must believe that God is, and you must believe that, that and trust in the Lord. And here's what this verse is saying. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This, these words right here are literally the definition of faith in this context. In this context. And that is that without faith, what do you mean without faith it's impossible to believe him? He who comes to God must believe, first of all, that God exists and that God rewards. You know what most people believe? That God exists and God's punished that God is a punisher. There are far more people on planet earth that think God is a judge, God is a punisher. And the Bible does, he does judgment and he does punish, but that is not what he's saying that pleases him for you to identify your relationship with him that way. Your relationship needs to be that he is, he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And the word please means in order for you to be accepted by God, you gotta do these things. Continue, let's look at the word must. He said, yeah, you're really tearing this apart. He said, for he who comes to God must, must. The word for must means the character of necessity or obligation in the event, in an event. The term itself does not denote the authority which imparts this character. In other words, this must is telling you about a character that you have to have, but must doesn't have the ability to give you that character. And the character that you need to have is believe. In fact, this is setting you up for the prerequisite, which meaning you have to, your prerequisite is believing. It's believing. Continue. Let's jump down to the word believe. The word believe here from the Greek means to be persuaded of and hence to place confidence in, to trust. Believe sometimes sounds like the word faith, but what you need to understand is the word believe means you have been persuaded. And faith, you have been persuaded to faith. Believing means that I've been persuaded, I've heard the information, and I'm persuaded that God is, and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then that what I'm doing is when I'm persuaded and accept that viewpoint, I now have faith. And now I've got faith in God and now I'm able to please God. I don't know about you, but I sure do want to live a life that's pleasing to God. You know what I want to hear at the end of my life is well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear that. In order to do that, I have to be, I have to, please God, which means I need to be accepted by God. And the only way I can be accepted by God is not by doing, but by trusting. Now, my trust in God, my persuasion of believing God will produce a relationship where I live with God. And if I'm living with God, I am living what he wants in my life. I'm living in harmony. In order for you to live with God, there has to be a harmony there. And the harmony that's required is that I've got to do life his way. It's not a negotiating thing. It's not like, God, I, I want to talk to you about this situation, and I think there's a better way of doing it than what you have done in the past. And God says, no, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I'll always do this. This will always be this way. And so what you need to know is believing here is in relationship to the faith, to believe to the extent of complete trust and reliance. You've been persuaded to the point that you trust and you rely on. 
Let me give you an example. You are persuaded, persuaded. I'll give you an example of being persuaded, trusting, relying on, and then actually doing a behavior. You're at an amusement park. I don't care which amusement park. I don't even care what state. It's just an amusement park. And it's a high quality amusement park and it's pretty clean, all right? You go to the bathroom. You are persuaded that there is facilities under the room or where the direction that says restrooms, there could be a sign, it could say men, it could say women, but you are persuaded and you believe that I'm walking in that room to relieve myself. I knew you'd like this example. <clears throat> now, let's just pretend it's not a busy day at the amusement park, so there's not a line out the door for women. Okay? That the facility is available immediately. And you, you go to a particular uh, feature in that room that is labeled urinal or toilet or whatever it might be. And in that situation, you believe, you believe that you will be able to use that facility according to what is needed. You've been persuaded and you've been now believing and trusting and relying. So what you need to now realize is you are walking out your belief. You're walking out your trust. You're walking out your persuasion. So now apply that to spiritual things. In the, in the spiritual things, what you do is that you are persuaded that what you've heard about God is true, that he really does exist. And now you read more about God and you find out more about him and that you find out that he is a God of love, a God of forgiveness, a God of justification, a God of deliverance, a God of righteousness, a God who truly looks after those that he calls his own and they are diligently seeking him and he is rewarding you. Continue. Let's go. Like I said, we're going to tear it apart. Let's talk about the two is's. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh, the is and the is. The first one, the one comes to God, or the one that comes to God must believe two things. First, that he exists, and second, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. The first is is the translation of this particular Greek word. I'm not even going to try because I go too fast and I'll make a mistake, but you can read it, which speaks of existence. This particular verb is identifying that something exists. It, it could be a rock. It could be a horse. It could be a mountain. It could be a tree. But in this situation, it is it is speaking of the existence of God himself, that he is he exists. That's what this is saying to us. And the second is, the second verb is, is the translation of this particular Greek word. The ideal is not merely that God exists as a rewarder, but that he will prove himself to be a rewarder of that person who diligently seeks him. This word is, is not just a label that he's a rewarder, but it actually it emphasizes because it being a verb, it's an action, it is referring to something that God does. It is not just identifying him. It's not just saying that he's a rewarder. It's not just a label. It's not just the name. What it is, is an action of God. You need to believe that God first is, exist. Second is, is that he is constantly rewarding those who diligently seek him. So we continue. Now let's talk about the word reward, the, re the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Is one who delivers reward or recompense. And this word for reward, remember we said he is a rewarder. This Greek word means the one who's delivering the one that brings the reward, the one who has the ability. It's not impossible for God to reward you. It's not impossible for God to deliver you. It's not impossible for God to heal you. What he's declaring is step one of Christianity, step one of faith, 
the foundation of faith. Now, we build on that, and faith has a lot more components to it. It's multifaceted. It's a, there's a manifold understanding of both God's grace and God's faith. But at the very, very essence, the foundation needs to be you need to believe that God exists. And then you need to believe that in his existence, he enjoys, he looks forward to, he is constantly one that is rewarding those who seek him. So whenever, what's ever going on in your life, if you are seeking God, if you're going after his, his will, his presence, he is going to constantly be rewarding you. This whole talk has to do with how do I please God? How do I please God? The way I please God is going to be by faith. I must have faith in him. I must believe that he is, and I must believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So this little word faith is what I've been talking about today, and we'll continue and, and continue flowing this way. Now, faith, this is the substance, this is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want you to realize that faith is something that God has given you. The Bible says that you have a faith and it's a grace, it's a gift of God itself. And that faith is something that gives you the ability to believe in God. And when you exercise your faith, you now actually have a power, a weapon, something that, subs that, is, that is actual thing that you have, that you own, that you possess, and that's your trust in God. Trust is not a fleeing thing. Trust is a thing that is built. When a man and a woman meet each other and they start to date, and eventually, let's say, they get married... In all normal circumstances, what will take place is as they grow in their relationship with each other, trust should grow. There should be more trust in your relationship 20 years later than 20 days later. Should be. And that is if the two of you live in harmony, openness, trustworthiness, you know, um, your heart is growing together. Uh, I refer to my wife, Suzette, as my girlfriend. I call her my girlfriend. I leave her notes as my girlfriend. Uh, other, you know, uh, and why do I do that? One is, if I already have a girlfriend, I don't need one. So um, the other is, is just growing further and further and further and deeper and deeper in love with her. And the love that I have with her is always associated with the trust I have in her. She is my best friend, literally my best friend, and she knows everything about me. There's nothing that's a secret. There's no secret passcodes on our, my phone. She knows every password I have, everything about me. It's just nothing is hidden and nothing is, is in dark. And if there's something she doesn't know, it's because uh, I just haven't thought about saying it. Now, the woman on the other side is a complex. <laughs> complex gift of God. I don't know if you want to call them onions where you keep peeling and peeling and peeling and find out something more about them or an orange where you have to peel it and then each slice is a new discovery because I have even in the last year, discover things I never knew. It was very recently, we've been married 25 years, it was just a few months ago, I said, I never knew that. <laughs> you never told me. And it seems to be the mystery of the woman <laughs> and the man's job to go after and diligently seek all the mysteries. Now, you have a perfect example of God and man. Men, we are in trouble. Because if we don't diligently seek our wives, we will not learn the mysteries because a lot of times they just don't think about telling you. Like, I didn't think that was important. But the other thing is, when we go after God, God unveils himself more and more and more and more, reveals himself. And as you diligently seek, you, there's no, you do not have a long enough life on planet Earth to learn all of God. And I believe in eternity we will continue to be uh, amazed at God uh, unraveling 
All of his kindness, his love, his greatness, his smarts, his intelligence. But now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Talking to you about faith. Faith is is believing that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. On the very basis of faith, I have not seen God. I've never seen God. I've never seen Jesus. I know people who have. I know that people have been to heaven and come back. I know people have physically seen or spiritually seen. I haven't. Uh, but I still believe. I believe. I believe he exists, and I believe he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek, that seek him. And you say, well, how is it that you believe? Because of faith. Th- my faith is the substance of what I'm hoping for, and that's the very presence and essence of God. And evidence of things not seen. I haven't seen God, but my faith is proof that he exists. Now, my faith can't prove to you that he exists, but your faith can prove to you that he exists because it goes back to having a persuasion and then a confidence and a believing in. Hebrews 11.1 1 from the Weiss translation, now faith is the title deed of things hoped for, the proof of things which are not being seen. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that a few years ago, I paid off my car and I have the title deed. I own the pink slip. You know, it's in a safe, locked away. You will never get it. (laughs) But it's a title deed. Uh, About 10 years ago, uh, Suzette and I, we paid our house off and got the title in our name only, not in in anyone else. The bank doesn't own it. We have a titled deed. And it says, now faith is the titled deed of things hoped for and the proof of things which are not being seen. For an example, if I had my pink slip of the car, you may have never even seen my car. You may have no clue what car in the car I drive or what color of the car, but I could show you the pink slip and you go, oh well, yeah, you do, you got a car. Your faith is the pink slip of believing in God. Your faith is, is the proof in your relationship that God exists. Taking that, now let's talk about faith real quick and I'm gonna hit you with a couple of of real fast questions. Does faith give me access to the blessings of God? And it says, according to Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. I love it that God named his throne. He named it grace. He says that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In order for you to have faith work on your behalf, you need to know that God has opened the throne room to you through the blood of Jesus. You have every right to come to the throne of God, every right to believe God, to trust in God, to come to him and to ask something in prayer and for him to answer it. You need to first of all believe in something that you don't see and that's his answer is going to be, we'll work it out and make it work for you. And so we want to continue. So why faith? Why, why in the world did God create a system based off of faith? Why is it impossible to please God except by faith? Why must I believe that he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him? Why did he do that? Why in the world? Why didn't he do it some other way? Why didn't he do it by uh, being kind for 15 days in a row? You know, uh, some of us could make it. And then why... <laughs> So let's, let's look at it. Why? Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is, being it, it's an absolute, an existence of faith, that it might be according to grace. God said he put the system of faith together in order for it to be by grace. Faith can never receive something grace hasn't already appropriated. And grace is the very power of God that allows you to be delivered from whatever it is, the situation. It begins with salvation. There's a grace for salvation, but there's also a grace for healing. There's a grace for your your marriage. There's a grace for your finances. There's a grace for you to walk successfully in the spirit. There's a grace that comes from God, but you access the faith, the grace by faith. He goes, therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise 
So that the promise, whatever the promise might be, it's not labeling it and holding it just to a single promise, but in this context of the chapter, it's referring to your salvation, referring to your eternal life relationship, but it's also taking into every other area that you can appropriate grace to from faith so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, to not only those who are of the law, those that behave, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham because they believe. Again, here it is, faith. If I have trust and confidence in God himself, then God has said that all the promises of God are yes and amen. God has said that you, nothing shall be impossible to him who believes. What is it that I believe? I believe that God is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That's what I believe. So I have to diligently seek him. I have to diligently seek him for my marriage. I have to diligently seek him for my career. I have to diligently seek him for my healing. I have to diligently seek him in all these areas of life. I have to go after all that he has, and that's why it is. It's the reason he built the system faith is so that it would be reliant on him and Everybody, no matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter where you were born in the world, doesn't matter whether you are male or female, doesn't matter what your age is, faith knows no boundaries based off of those items and those things. So we need to realize that it's going to be of faith, that without faith, you're never going to appropriate the grace of God. You're not going to receive what God has already, have, already has for you. So how do I use my faith on purpose? According to Romans 16, and we're going to go verses uh, five through, all the way to chapter 5. But we just read this. Therefore, it is the faith that it might be according to grace, so the promise might be sure. Let's continue. Let's go to verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, speaking to Abraham. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead. This is amazing. God who gives life to the dead. I don't care what's dead. I don't care if you think your relationship is dead. God can give life to it. I don't care if you think your finances are dead. God can give life to it. I don't care if you're, you think your body is dead, your physical body is no good, never can be healed. God can give life to it. God is the one who gives life to the dead. And, 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 and look what, this is God. God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Again, this has to do with faith. God is calling what doesn't exist as it does. Some people call that being stupid and, and lacking reality and not being down to earth. But I don't want to be down to earth. I want to be in heaven. And I want heaven's laws operating on earth. And according to this, God says that he calls those things that do not exist as those things. God's going to cause, call my poverty, call me out of poverty into a sustained life. God's going to call my dead body into a live body, into healed. God is going to call my dead relationship into a live relationship. And he's going to say it first before it ever happens. And I mean, I have to agree with him and say it with him. And let's go to verse 18. Who, contrary to hope, this is Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what, that, what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Okay, what this is referring to, Paul, the author of the book of Romans, is saying, going back to the time where Abraham had no children, and God said to him, I want you to look at the sky and look at all the stars. He goes, you'll have that many kids, you know, that many descendants. That's, this will be your family. But he doesn't even have one. But God says, so shall your descendants be. And he's, and he's saying here, in hope, Abraham at this time is around 90 years old at the time that he gets this promise from God. Sarah, his wife, is around 80 years old, and she's already been through the process of the change of life and is not ovulating. Is that the right? Ovulate, yeah. She's not having a period. Her body stopped functioning that way. And God says, you're going to have a child. Well, contrary to hope, contrary to hope, in, listen to this, in hope, 
that's contrary to hope, Abraham believed. He was persuaded. The hope that changed the hope was the hope that God said, you will have descendants. The other hope is the body of Sarah says, no, I will have no children. And Abraham got persuaded by the hope he heard. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And his persuasion turns to faith, which is attached to hope, giving substance to hope. But it was still 10 years later when Sarah has a, has a son. We don't give up. Abraham not giving up. Just because God said it doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. But we need to have faith in him. Verse 19, and being not, and listen, this is amazing. And not being weak in faith, which means you can be. Not being weak in faith, which means the opposite is true. You could be weak in faith. You could be weak in your confidence. Are you sure, God? Is that, is that ever going to happen? Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So you got two old people. I, you know, at my very young, spry age, I still am, I wouldn't want another child. <laughs> Let's have grandkids. Anyway, just trying to lighten it up a little. Some of you are like... He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Here's where it gets real picky. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. When we start to think that God promised something and we attached, maybe it's not for me, or I'm not sure, or I don't know, or you know what? What we end up doing a lot of times, we take life experiences and we interpret scripture that we're reading with our life experience instead of saying, maybe my experience could be different if I trust this. For an example, when somebody sees this, that he didn't waver at the promise of God, and then we apply it to our own life, and you have something wrong with your physical body, you've got a challenge with your body, you need a healing in your body, and we start quoting healing scriptures to you, and start talking to you about that by his stripes you are healed, that he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, and we start making all kinds of declarations of healing towards you, and you look at past life experiences and interpret scripture by your past life experience, for an example, you say, well, I prayed and I didn't get healed. Therefore, it must not be God's will to heal everybody. You are now interpreting scripture by you instead of looking at scripture and say, maybe I could be different. And as soon as you take your life experience and interpret scripture from your life experience, you've put yourself in a very bad position to receive the promises of God because you are going to waver at the promise of God. You are not going to have hope against hope. You are going to now talk yourself that, well, that's, you'll, now you'll come up with new doctrine that's not in scripture. Well, maybe it's not God's will to heal everybody because if it was God's will to heal everybody, wouldn't everybody be healed? Well, you know, think about that question and ask yourself this, is it God's will for everyone to go to heaven? but yet people are going to hell every day. Is it God's will for people to be healed? Absolutely. But people aren't getting healed every single day. Now, you take life experience and then you interpret scripture by it and you make doctrine that the Bible isn't saying to comfort yourself. Now you're in trouble. You start getting scriptural blockage. What I mean by that is a new revelation the Holy Spirit wants to bring to you can't come through because you're saying it's not for me. And Abraham is saying it is for us. Verse 21, and believe it and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. This is it. He believed that God is and God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
Romans 5. Let's, we'll end with this. I have a lot more scriptures. They're in the, they're in the notes. If you got the notes uh, at, on you version, just to prove to you that uh, faith is important. And, you know, James, and I have a scripture in there from James about if you're double-minded, you're not going to receive anything from God. But here's what Romans 5 says, verses 1 and 2, super important. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We are accepted by God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2, through whom also we are accepted, we are justified, and justification is God declaring you right with him. We are justified by faith and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access, we have access, the ability to enter in and to receive. Doesn't guarantee, but you have access. Access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then as you continue to read, you'll find out that he's talking about trials and persecution and, and difficult parts of life. And what he's saying is that because you've been justified, because you believe God is, you've left the grace of justification. You've entered into the faith of salvation. And now you're entering into the next phase of faith. You're entering into more faith, which brings you into more grace. Because the Bible uses the phrase of having more grace from God. And what he's saying here is through whom also we have access by faith. We can enter into this grace in which we stand. And the standing is referring to life. What's going on in your life? God has a grace for you. God has a grace for you, and that grace is achieved by faith. Why were the people in the wilderness not pleasing to God? Yet, they did all the rituals, they did all the performances that Moses was introducing to them and beginning with the law, and the law of Moses was now being introduced to this very people, and they were all doing it. But yet, most of them, God wasn't well pleased. And we're finding out the only way you're going to please God is believe. Is believe his promises. Believe him. Believe he is. Believe he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Before the service today, I was in the room here before most people ever came in the room. And I was praying. And I was just walking. And I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit rise inside me. He said this phrase. Ashes to life. And I asked him, what does that mean in particular? And you know how you can have these very long conversations with the Holy Spirit and take like two seconds? Do you know what I mean? And it was like that. And I knew when he said, ashes to life, he said, if people will believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, whatever ashes you are in, he wants to bring you out of them into life. He wants to release life in you. He wants you to experience all that he has for you. He wants you to trust in him and for you to hold on to the promises like Abraham did. And he wants you to have hope against hope. He wants you to realize, wants you to realize that he isn't your enemy, he's your deliverer. That he didn't let this life happen to you He's the one delivering you from it and working in you. Ashes to life. What are your ashes? What's going on in your life? What's happening that you think is nothing but ash? God wants to give life to you. I'm going to ask you to do something very brave. I'm going to ask you to do something very courageous. If you feel like there's some ashes in your life, and I don't care what it has to do with, and I don't even need to know, nor does anyone else, but if you have ashes, if the ashes are relationship, the ashes are finances, the ashes are healing, whatever it might be, whatever you feel like, when I made that statement that I shared with you from the Holy Spirit, touched your heart and you identified with it, whether you're here in the room or whether you're watching on TV, 
I want to pray for you, but I'd like you to stand. I don't want you to come up here. I just want you to stand. If you have got some ashes that you want to come out of and you want to go into light and go into life, would you stand? You at home, same thing. I need you to get up out of the chair or off the couch or out of the bed, whatever it is. I need you to stand. I said this would be very courageous, very, very brave of you. But what I want to do is whatever. And, and the people that are standing here in the room, people are standing online. The ashes are all kinds of things. But what's so wonderful about Jesus, what's so wonderful about the Holy Spirit, what's so wonderful about our Heavenly Father is he can deliver from every ash. So I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to think of God, that he exists, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that you believe today you're coming out of the ashes and brushing them off of your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person standing right now. I pray for each individual that's in this room, each one watching online, and you know their ashes. You know the situation. I pray for deliverance. In the name of Jesus, be free of these ashes. Be delivered of them. Be completely released. And I pray, Holy Father, that they diligently seek you and your will and your way in this area of life. And that as they seek you, you reward them. They have stood because they are diligently believing in you, diligently seeking you, and we believe that you are and that you are a reward, rewarder of those who seek your face. And in the name of Jesus, I speak the name of Jesus over every situation right now and that, Father God, release your angelic power, release your promises, release your healing, release your deliverance into each one of them in the name of Jesus. In the name, let's all say it, in the name of Jesus. Amen? 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 Amen. Now all of us, let's stand and give the Lord a great big hand. Hallelujah, Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. We cheer Jesus. We cheer Jesus. We cheer Jesus. I think it's so awesome. Two things happen in the life of Moses when he took the people and split them up to two hills. And they... they, uh, read the promises and blessings of God. And then they read the cursings, the curses of the law and God. And at, at the end of each statement, each reading, there was a yell of amen, which means so be it, which also means I agree. Let it be as if I said it myself. And then they applauded. And when they applaud, demons hear the cheer of Jesus and have to flee. And I think it's important, like when we give a big applaud to Jesus, demons are like, ah, and they take off. Amen. 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 Well, while you're standing, I've got to ask you a question. While you're watching online, I need to ask you this question. Have you ever accepted Jesus into your life? If something were to happen today and you died, would you go to heaven? He said, I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Delivered. Shall be set free. Shall be brought into a life eternal. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, right now is the time to do it. Right now is the moment. Would everyone bow their head, close their eyes? No one looking around. Every head bowed every eye closed. At home, you may be, you're standing with us right now. You can just bow your head. I'm going to ask you, 
If you've never asked Jesus in your life, said, I need to, I need to have Jesus come into my heart. I need to have Jesus come into my life. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand anywhere in the room. Just put your hand up in the room. At, at home, do the same thing. Just put your hand up. Say, I need to ask him into my life. I need Jesus. At home as well. Now, in the name of Jesus, I want you to just do a simple, simple prayer. And that is, say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come and be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my life. Amen. And amen. And amen. If you said that in your heart, would you lift your head, open your eyes. If you said that in your heart, if you made that prayer with me, then I want you to realize that Jesus Christ has come into your life as the Bible has promised and made you a new creation. He said, I'm not sure what that means. You will find out as you continue to seek the Lord. You'll find out new and more and more about your life with God, your life with the Spirit. But if you are at home or you're here and you said yes to Jesus, I would love for you to text the words new life to the phone number on the screen. This will allow us to send you some other information on what your next step are, what, what's going to happen next, what you can do next.